Well, as the US closes out and looks ahead to the seasonal Thanksgiving holiday period, we see the S&P closing out the month about 5% higher. The Dow's up 7%. We've got the US dollar up 2%. We see you know, the Japanese yen starting to find some traction. Uh, gold closes the year month down about 4% at the moment. And Bitcoin's up about 33%. But can it continue as we look ahead into what will be a very lively December in terms of the event risk? We've got payrolls. We've got US CPI. We've got a whole plethora of central banks who are expected to ease with the market pricing in a conjecture about whether or not we get more cuts or less cuts. Yeah, this could lead to a very lively December indeed. And we break it all down. We look at the trades that matter are on the radar. So stay tuned. This is The Trade-Off. Well, hi there. My name is Chris Weston from Pepperstone. I'm going to be joined in two seconds by Blake Morrow from Forex Analytics. And we will be discussing everything that's going on in the markets, where we see the direction of travel, the risks in the markets, how we should manage those, the setups that are front of mind, the flows, the movers and shakers. And we break down the trades that we like and the direction of travel, as I say. Mr. Blake Morrow, come into the program. I want to talk to you Thanksgiving, gratitude, gratitude for everything that we have that works in our life and for our family and friends. And we've got gratitude for you, Blake, for, for sticking around and and giving us your views this year, it's been fantastic. And you know, obviously, people have got some great value there. So, thank you for that. And what are you what are you planning to do for Thanksgiving this year? Well, we're gonna we're gonna be traveling a little bit for Thanksgiving, and I and I do I want to give thanks to all of our to to not only your staff there at uh, at Pepperstone, but all of our viewers as well. You know, this is the time of year us Americans we like to reflect on uh, on you know what we are thankful for, and I'm thankful that. You know, I, I think we're going on three years of uh, of this show, and uh, and I'm thankful for it. I I I enjoy um, thoroughly the show and and analyzing the markets with you because you bring up a lot of things that I wasn't necessarily looking at, and and I think that's that's true probably for a lot of traders out there. So thank you, and thank you all for tuning in every every single week. Cool. Well, I hope the Morrow family has a, a a great holiday, and for anyone else out there who's celebrating out there. We hope that you have a safe and and and, and merry um, thanks. Can you use the word merry? Is that the right term? Um, but I hope you have a great time anyway. Anyway, let's go into topical thunder and see what's going on in the markets. Let's go to December risk because yeah, I've pulled up a chart which we're gonna we're gonna chuck in and 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 you can see. Um, but I want to talk about December, Blake, because obviously we're closing out November. We look ahead as traders. We want to understand what. And as traders, you know, investors live in the future. I like to think we live more in the present. You know, we 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 trade what's in front of us at that time. The aggregation of flows, behaviors, all beliefs that are coming through in the price action. We trade what's in front of us now. The volatility, the trend. Yeah, we're seeing mean reverting markets. It's, it's what we put in front of us now. But we do look ahead into December and we say, what is the propensity? What are the event risks that we see? That could cause bigger moves. Now, obviously, we've got the macro factors. More tariffs are probably more likely to come through. Yeah, relative growth rates, yeah, geopolitical issues. Um, although, you know, thankfully, we're seeing some more positive and constructive headlines of late. But I want to talk about the central bank side of things, Blake, because you know, I look down at this chart that, that we've got in front of here. It's, it's, it's a bit of a, an Excel job, but um, you know, you can see all the central banks that are going to be meeting through December. Obviously, we've just seen the key, the, the RBNZ cutting fifty basis points, and they're getting closer towards their their trough rates. Um, but look, I mean, we've got take out Australia and the UK, which um, yeah meets it's sort of mid December, um, and they're not expected to do anything. They're both expected firmly to to keep rates on hold. Um, but I look at Canada at the moment, um, and they've got obviously GDP numbers and jobs numbers coming through. But the market's pricing a twenty five basis points as a given for that meeting, and there's actually a one in three chance that we get a fifty basis point cut. You go to Europe, and we've got a sixteen percent chance for fifty basis point cut. Obviously. This is going to be conditional. We'll see what happens with the CPI numbers later this week um, in Europe and, and some of the sort of regional numbers there. That, that could increase, depending on the, the outcome, obviously, the, the chance for a 50 basis point cut. Um, yeah, in the US, we've got, yeah, this, the opposite's true. Could we see a hold or could we see a 25 basis point cut? At the moment, the market's pricing 17 basis points or a, a two and three chance that we get a 25 basis point cut. And Japan, there's a 50-50 chance they raise rates by 25 basis points as well. So, you know, we go into this month where yeah, sort of five or so central banks um, are expected to ease. And there's actually conjecture whether they, in terms of the pricing, the pricing's line bull call. And we've got in the US, we've obviously got um, payrolls numbers that come out on the 6th of December. If they're weak again, that could 
you know, increase the probability. If they're really strong, then obviously that could lower the probability. And then we've got CPI numbers coming out on the 10th or 11th. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say here, Blake, is that we've got a whole raft of central banks coming through, some key data, and the market sort of torn between the actions, which suggests to me in a period where we're going to get reduced liquidity, that we could see these dynamics mean it, we, we need to be on our toes, especially for FX and rates traders. So, you know, I think we, we're, in, we're in for a potential December with a lot of landmines still to come. How are you seeing this? I, you know, and uh, you you pointed out uh, just fine, and um, and I and I love the I love the uh, the the schematic you put up there, even though it's an Excel spreadsheet. It's great because it really shows you the 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 dynamics and the divergence between some central banks. And just remember, all this data that we're going to be getting is really crammed in the first three weeks of December. So it is going to be a lively. L I V lively, yep, I reckon lively, and and you know, um, you you did mention it briefly, but I do want to say that, and we're going to talk about the dollar because I think the dollar is at the, at kind of the epicenter of everything. Next week, and I know we're going to have another trade off before this happens, so you're going to hear us talk about it again next week. But next week, we're going to get the jobs report, and the market or economists are expecting that uh, the U.S. is going to create, you know, somewhere between ten and twenty thousand jobs. Um, that's really close to missing you could you could you could have you could miss that number have a negative print and that's going to weigh on sentiment so it's a it, you know chris there there are a lot of li landmines and it is going to be lively and it's all going to be in a short period and as you pointed out liquidity is going to be very bad so that actually brings us to like our next topic which i want to go up i want to talk about and i want to talk about trading in this trading environment and not only the next couple of days because you know it's the thanksgiving holiday but it's just the lack of liquidity that we're going to see but let me take a moment just to speak about thanksgiving and by the way I, I am driving out of town uh like literally by the time some of you are watching this you're gonna i'll be gone and there's a lot of traders that are traveling in the united states across the country different places to spend thanksgiving holiday with their family Liquidity is going to be poor. I, I've I've had I remember Thanksgiving holidays where the day after Thanksgiving, um, one of the one of the Middle Eastern um, markets completely collapsed. I believe it was in Saudi Arabia or like in Kuwait, something like that. Um, I've I've carved up turkey uh, and and on Thursday, which would be tomorrow, and I've seen three hundred pip moves in the euro. When there's a lot of flows, like we we have a lot of end of month flows that are still being pushed through the market for the next couple of days, if there's no liquidity and those flows need to get done, they're going to get done. And if there's not somebody on the other side of the market, you could see these moves really accelerate. And you get that in the month of December too, because at the end of year, after having a 30% rise in the S&P, like literally 28% in the over the course of 2024, the end of year flows are going to be massive, massive. So what does that mean? Put it all together. Hey, look, I, I was I was live by this rule. Um, you know, it's okay to be wrong. It's not okay to stay wrong. And indefinitely, when there's no liquidity or a lack of liquidity for the next few weeks, you know, look, if you're you're on the wrong side of something, get out because it could get worse. I've been I've been there. But Chris, I wanted to talk a little bit about the trading environments we're going to be witnessing. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, I think you know. The, the the yeah liquidity is obviously going to be a thematic. I mean, you you'll get out of the trade, you'll be able to move an order, but you know you're just going to move the order book a little bit more. Um, but I think yeah, we go into December and you know this idea about chase certainly it's, a, it's an equity thematic, and and that that whole idea about a seasonal Santa Claus rally, that that is purely predicated on the performance of the S and P and the Nasdaq going into December. You know, statistically over the last twenty years. If the S&P is up over 15%, 90% of the time, you see the S&P higher in, in December. And that's because you've got those active managers who have to benchmark themselves chasing the performance into the end of the year. And obviously, if the S&P is at 3% performance year to date, then, then people will just probably lock in performance because there is no performance. But yeah, the S&P has had such a ripping year that, that you're going to get active managers who are slightly under underwater. If the market goes up, they need to not only be in the market they need to to increase risk to be above benchmark returns the other the, the thing that counters that is because we've had such a good year you do get a lot of pension funds and and portfolio and, and mutual funds that will need to rebalance and that means selling so you've got active managers who have to chase and that's obviously positive and on the flip side then you're going to have a lot of these mutual funds that, that will need to rebalance the question is is will they do it 
this year or do they wait out until next year hoping they can net out a bit more returns so that that's another factor but yeah look, this idea about santa claus and chasing is really predicated on on how the s p has performed and we've had an absolute stonky year so active if you're underwater you've got to dial up that risk in december if it keeps going up but what's interesting is i'll go into the dollar now is that um, you know tech is now start tech lacks a catalyst and for the index to really make a make a stage higher this year you're going to need to see semis working and they're not at the moment they're they're sort of missing a catalyst and they're going sideways so you know why would you want to chase those those stocks you know the nvidia's of this world the amds if the semis you know everyone wants banks everyone wants you know some cyclicality um but it's it's the sort of more defensive reits that are working well utilities working well so for the for the index to really make a, a staggering return you're going to need to see nvidia fly um you're going to need to see microsoft fly we're not seeing that at the moment so we'll need to see that happening but yeah it's going to be an interesting one obviously with central banks as well so yeah but keep an open mind and, and be a slave to the tape is the idea let's go into let's go into the dollar sorry i've just i've been taking up a bit of time there well, so, well like, actually we've, we've, we've been in the dollar already so uh, i think that's, uh, that's my producer with his uh, taking taking the wrong cruise with his trigger <laughs> trigger finger um anyway let's just go into the dollar because i think personally um tactically the dollar's got some downside in the short term now. We talked about that chart, which showed um, all these central banks who are pricing in a bit more. For me, the Fed are going to cut rates by 25 basis points. Obviously, it's going to be conditional on payrolls um, and all these factors. Um, but I don't think the ECB are going to have 50 basis points. So, you know, obviously, we'll have to see what happens with the inflation numbers. And it's a big what if. But I think what I think at the moment, my base case is that the ECB cut 25 basis points. And as we saw from the RBNZ yesterday, when, when they priced in a little bit more of a 75, they didn't deliver the 75 that, that the market had been pricing in. We saw a massive move in the dot in, in the Kiwi. Um, so maybe the same things are true. The world is, is long of dollars. Um, we're looking at um, the Bank of Japan probably maybe looking to raise rates. We're seeing the yen respond. Dollar yen's come down before the below the levels that we saw, you know, from the from the election. Um, a bit comes out of you know some of this pricing in Bank of Canada um ecb all these other factors and therefore tactically it makes me say that maybe there's some short-term downside in the us dollar as we reprice those rates markets how do, how do you see that well I'm, I'm seeing it just like you and i'm i'm actually a little dollar heavy on some of the setups so i'm i'm gonna kind of reserve myself a little bit but I, this is goes back to what i just said a moment ago i think that the this jobs report this next week and again we're going to talk about it again next wednesday but the jobs report, I think, is going to be crucial to the dollar. Um, I think you know everybody's pretty, pretty, pretty much in in unison that that inflation is getting a little sticky. But if the the labor market starts to show signs of weakness, and we uh, have a, a jobs report where we actually lose jobs, and can then I just, you get can people. I just jump in. I just want to say I'm just yeah. looking at the, I'm just looking at the Bloomberg consensus now, and there's not many, but yeah, the, the consensus now for payrolls is two hundred thousand. That's what I'm saying. 200,000? 200, I thought it was 12,000. It might have changed because it's yeah, everyone's still got to put their put their yeah, their views in, all the economists are still doing, but the, the current consensus on Bloomberg now is, is 200,000. So okay. a, nice, a nice snapback as, as obviously some of the port disruptions and weather related issues come back out. Okay. All right. Well, you know, I, I was looking at data from earlier today, but th it doesn't really matter. It, the, the, the fact of the matter is the jobs report will matter. That's what I'm trying to point yeah, exactly. out. Yeah, exactly. It it's going gonna, it's gonna to matter to the dollar. It's going to matter to probably the overall direction. I think that the dollar has been sold. Um, we've seen this like false breakout, and that's concerning if you're a dollar bull. And uh, but the flip side is, you know, uh, there's a couple of things. The CFTC data is very, as you pointed out, very long of dollars. You can see the market's very long of dollars. So there could be a lot of unwinds and remember you know talk about end of year flows if the stock market is just everybody's chasing they're going to be selling dollars to do that and uh so i think the dollar is in a pretty precarious situation but anyway i, I know we talked a lot about the dollar and i'm gonna I, I need to wrap things up and move it to our last topic which is about the man of the hour the great man who, who's going to get the nobel peace prize uh when he brings world peace to the uh center he's already, stage. he's already won it four times <laughs> <laughs> well trump uh i wanted to talk about president-elect trump and uh just the fact that uh volatility has come early and it's here to stay guys i want to talk a little bit about this because kind of with the other topic about trading and lack of liquidity trump is uh he is a uh, an enigma of sorts when it comes to the markets. And, you know, 
These headlines come out fast and furious. For example, you guys were up in the morning already a couple of days ago when he named Besant as his treasury secretary. And it was actually on a Friday after the market had closed. The dollar responded. We saw gaps. And then the very next day, as you, you know, he brings in somebody like Besant, who is going to be more, you know, uh, tariff friendly, if you will, not put it, push as hard on tariffs. That is the theme. The dollar sold off. And then not even 24 hours uh, after the market was open, he then says, we're going to, you know, implement 25% tariffs on Canada, Mexico, you know, and on oil, oil, oil imports. Uh, we fent we want to you know curb fentanyl and illegal immigration, all this stuff that is completely opposite of bringing Besson in. The dollar turned around and ripped, and then turned around. And it's obviously been a lot of volatility. It's been very, yeah. very, very, very um, uh, a scary, scary type of trading environment. But that is Trump in a nutshell. And what I learned, and I'm going to pass it over to you. What I learned over his previous four years as president is I can't really hold on to swing trades unless they're really in the money. But how do you see this Trump volatility playing out the next few years? Well, I think it's, it's, it's pretty confined into the FX space because bond volatility has subsided and, and the VIX is now trading at 14% and it's come down below sort of 20-day realized volatility. So yeah, it, I, we have seen a noticeable pickup in, in statistical levels of FX volatility. And, and partly that can be down to Trump and partly it can be attributed to the fact that we are seeing yeah, clear divergent setting from central banks expected. When you get all central banks acting as one, all cutting rates, similar tunes, you get suppressed volatility in the FX markets. When you start saying 2025, the Fed are going to be doing one thing, the ECU are going to be doing another, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, you know, the, the PBOC are going to be doing different things. That's when we get dispersions. That's when we get trends coming through in the bond market. And that's where we get higher volatility. And we're seeing people price that now. So you're absolutely on the money with that one. Um, but, you know, Trump's assembled his team now. We've got the, the trade representative, uh, Jamison Greer, you know, Besson. You know, he's, he's established his team around him. And, and I think what he's shown with tariffs, and, and it's tariffs and immigration that he's going to go to from day one with, with inauguration, is that he's, he's not going to mess around. I mean, the big difference between Trump 2.0 and Trump 2016 is he, he wasn't really prepared in 2016. I don't think he was expected to win it, to be honest. Um, but he's now, he knows exactly what he's got to do. He's got a great team around him. Well, he's got, I can't say that, I'm not political, but he's, 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 he, he, he knows what works. He knows he's got the legislation on board. He can go from day one. And he's coming hard straight from day one. And, and those tariffs on China, he's adding an extra 10%. They'll continue to go up. And we're probably going to get another one through December. But he's, he's, he's not messing around. He's not here for a haircut. And, um, you know, he's been forceful. He's got a big team, strong team and, and a knowledgeable team around him. Um, and I think that that, that those tariffs will, will increase volatility. And I think China's the big interesting one, because if you have a look at everyone's talking about this idea that you know, the yuan you know, depreciated 11% in 2018, 2019. But it wasn't until the tariffs actually were implemented. You know, a lot of the time we try and price things in earlier. We say tariffs are coming in. Let's start selling this, that, and the other currency like we do with the Mexican peso. China's a different beast, though. China waits because it's a managed currency. They wait until the facts happen. It's actually implemented. And then lost in what we've seen is that they, then they start to depreciate the yuan. So I think that's going to happen. But it won't happen until that actually, actually happens on, on the 20th of January. And I think you're going to see a much weaker yuan. And that's going to increase. If we were to see that trend, um, again, that's just going to perpetuate um, volatility in the effects markets. But you know, and I, Blake, love, we love volatility. What we don't yes, love we is, do. is or what we don't like, well, I don't, you know, what doesn't, it depends on your trading style, of course, is up one day, down the next day. I want some momentum in the market. You know, so I want, I want you know, some actual rate of change and a, a continuation of that trend. Um, up and down one day is, is a tough one to do. So we love vol, we love volatility, we love range expansion, but I also love a bit of momentum and trend to, to catch on with those swing trades as you talked about. Anyway, Trump brings volatility also changes the way that we we communicate and, and receive information so you know we're all uh, we've all gone out and changed you know looked at social media and and you know trump everybody truth. got their truth social yeah. uh, exactly. profile that's the way <laughs> anyway let's go to the charts of matter let's go to that's the setup
Yeah, Blake, I feel like we're a bit old to be messing around all these different social media channels channels these days, but that's, uh, that's the way of the world. And the algos have received them and, and trade it much quicker than us anyway. Let's go to Buy America. I want to go to this idea. It's something I've been pushing for a while. Um, you know, I think it, this is now a massive consensus trade and it's a worrying consensus trade. And, you know, I'd love to hear everyone else's views out here. But, yeah, this is a trade that I've been I've always been pushing for a while and it's the idea of being short Europe, uh, long America. And we're doing that through – you can do that through – yeah, euro dollar obviously we've seen euro dollar trade into what like yeah 10330 odd or so and it's snapped back a bit now um but certainly from an equity perspective you know you can go and have a look at france which has got all sorts of political issues taking place at the moment yeah collapsed governments in the making um but yeah we've got euro stocks as your sort of classic benchmark there and you know as it's going down um you know you're seeing the s p outperform as the denominator now i i think we're getting to a point where this this trade is overdone um, that there's not a lot to like about Europe, to be honest, from a growth perspective. You know, the ECB have still got more work to do. The Fed may look to hold off because you know, we could see a strong payrolls number. But let's see what happens. Um, but I think we are getting to the point now where over the last six months, the differential in performance is about 20 percent. Now, if you look over the last 20 years, whenever we've got that 20 percent six month underperformance, you know, you have seen a snapback. And the, the sample's not massive. There's like five or six different occur occurrences. But I think there's so much negativity priced into European stocks that I feel like we're getting to a point where we might see a tactical rally and a bit of outperformance in, in European equities. Um, I'll wait till price tells me to push into the trade. But this is a trade I've been pushing for a long time. It's been working well. It's everyone's in the trade who are doing long, short strategies. Um, I feel like it's probably got to the point where um, yeah, we take profits on that trade, but um, yeah, it takes a brave man to be going long Europe and short US. But uh, I feel we're getting to that point where tactically it could happen. Wow, that is a that is definitely an established trend, Chris. Well, you know, selling Europe on rallies does make sense to me. All right, well, my uh, my first setup is going to be the Kiwi, and um, you know, first thing I, I I look at when I look at this chart is uh, it, it, this is an impulsive move uh, that was following the RBNZ you know, last night. And um, if you think about what we've been talking about throughout this entire show. Hey traders, I apologize for the technical difficulties that we've had, but Westy and I, we did not want to leave without giving you our plays of the day. So here they are. Now my play of the day, I'm looking at Aussie Yen. Um, we have seen that technical break. You know, Aussie Yen has been moving sideways in this sort of short-term consolidation period um, for a couple of weeks now. And you know, we see that downside break through 99, 40 odd. Um, the question is, is can this kick? Now, of course, this trade, like any trade, comes with risk and that needs to be managed. Um, but I think the market has started to warm up to the idea that the Bank of Japan, Japan are going to be looking to hike rates in December, it's sort of 50-50 price. And if, obviously, if they don't look to hike by 25 basis points in the, in the in the December meeting, then they could go in January. And they may even look to do it in increments of 10, 15 basis points as well. But certainly, the market is warming up to that idea. And this is going to be conditional on the bank on, on the, the Tokyo CPI numbers later this week, because Governor Ada has effectively told us they are looking to, to hike rates. And it's going to be data dependent. So we'll see what happens there. But we like this trade because technically it has broken down. The question is, is can this kick to the downside? And I think that move, if it does to break down, is there for chasing. So I'm looking to sell into weakness. If this kicks lower, I want to go for this because this is quite a meaningful technical break. Now, the other factor is what happens with China. We are seeing a bit of a rebound in the Hang Seng and some of the Chinese equity markets. And that is usually quite good for Aussie yen. Um, but we'll see what happens there. We are seeing that yen re-emergence. And that's definitely something we need to watch. The Bank of Japan could be looking to raise rates. And I think, you know, this technical breakdown is one that I want to chase. So this is my play of the day today. All right. So I want to take a little bit and talk about my play of the day, which is the pound kiwi. You notice that we're developing this bull flag pattern. Now, the bull flag pattern, it was the bottom end of the flag was actually tested. And this was tested following the RBNZ. But you notice how we were talking about sterling and about UK rates and how the Bank of England might not cut rates. This might keep the sterling well bid. And so a move above flag resistance that comes in at 216, that's going to be pretty bullish. As long as we stay above 213.80, I think the flag stays intact and a bull flag could take us to new trend highs above 218. So that's my play of the day, pound kiwi. Good luck. All right, traders, that's a wrap for us at the trade-off. If you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and don't worry, we'll be back next week for the trade-off.